Earlier this year, I got to fulfill one of my lifelong ambitions as a film critic. I got to recreate the plot of that classic 2007 film, Mr. Bean's Holiday, by attending the Cannes International Film Festival. It's an item that has existed on my film critic bucket list for years, and it was wonderful to get a chance to check it off the list. So I packed up from Drury, Damp Ireland, a land of empty airport vending machines, and took flight to the sunny south of France, home to Orangina and Ballistos. But I thought it might be worth sharing some of that experience, in case anybody watching wanted to get a sense of what the festival was like. Now, if you're looking for coverage of the individual films and events, I published a day-by-day -day diary on the Second Wind Patreon that covered each film and event individually. So this video won't be going through the festival on a film-by-film -film basis. Instead, we'll try to capture a sense of what the festival actually is, what it was like to be at the festival, and just a general vibes check. But in short, it was really nice. One of the big assumptions about Cannes is that it's a single film festival. That's mostly true, but Cannes is really an umbrella for a number of different strands and groupings. There is the primary competition strand, which attracts a lot of the attention. It consists of around 20 films that form the spine of the festival, competing for the Palme d'Or, judged by a star-studded panel that was this year headed by Greta Gerwig. Incidentally, that jury does a lot to define the taste and the mood of the general festival. So for example, when Clint Eastwood headed the jury, the Palme d'Or went to Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction rather than Three Colors Red. When Quentin Tarantino headed the jury, the second place Grand Prix prize went to Old Boy. Perhaps the most interesting thing that Tim Burton has done in the past 20 years is to use his leverage as jury foreman to give the Palme d'Or to Uncle Boon Me who can remember his past lives. These 20 films that play in the competition are the movies that tend to get gala star-studded red carpet premieres. They are staggered across the two weeks, with each of the films screening multiple times so that assembled press and industry can get a chance to see them. However, there are other strands within the festival. There's the director's Fortnite, for example, which tends to offer quieter and more esoteric fare. Then there's Critics Week, which tends to include bolder and riskier choices than the main festival, younger directors, more extreme genres. Then there's Cannes Classics, which not only screens previous films that competed for the Palme d'Or, it also screens new documentaries, like for example Ron Howard's new film about Jim Henson, and restored classics like Steven Spielberg's Sugarland Express, or just films with big anniversaries like The Umbrellas of Sherberg. Then there are the films that just, well, screen at Cannes. So for example, the festival holds regular screenings on the beach, open to the public. But as you see, it's a beautiful day, the beaches are open, and the people are having a wonderful time. These screenings include classic movies like Porco Rossi and After Hours, along with new releases like the documentary My Way or Sulco Me Moi. There's also Midnight Madness screenings of movies that are technically out of competition because Cannes is still a fantastic platform to launch everything from a martial arts movie to that Nicolas Cage surfing horror film. Both of which, to be clear, rock. Very quickly, the number of films being screened in the city of Cannes over the fortnight increases dramatically. There is always something on. This gets at the interesting function of Cannes. Film festivals often serve as platforms for major releases, particularly awards contenders. This is particularly true of the festivals later in the year, for example, Venice or Toronto, which have recently become launching pads for major best picture contenders and wannabes. Cannes serves that function to a certain extent, but its place in the calendar makes it less appealing to big studio awards contenders, who prefer a tightly controlled awards narrative that minimizes the window for potential backlash. As a result, those movies tend to release later in the year, so they can capitalize on the success of nominations to push their financial prospects forward. Of course, Cannes still produces Oscar nominees and winners, but of a particular type. So for example, last year, three of the 10 Best Picture nominees premiered at Cannes, Anatomy of a Fall, The Zone of Interest, and Killers of the Flower Moon. Not coincidentally, those were three of the artiest of the nominees. Two of them weren't even primarily in English. Indeed, this year, the larger studios tend to stay away from Cannes. The only film from a major studio in competition was Yorgos Lanthimos' Kinds of Kindness, which was from Searchlight, a subsidiary of Disney that the company acquired with their purchase of Fox. Even then, Kinds of Kindness is an arthouse film, but not a likely Oscar contender. Even outside of competition, the biggest blockbuster to premiere at this year's Cannes Festival was Furiosa, which opened in theaters the following Friday. It 
also rocked. There are a couple of reasons why the big studios largely avoided Cannes this year. The first is a dearth of content in the wake of last year's disastrous strike. However, there is also a sense in which premiering a blockbuster at Cannes is now seen as a risky endeavour. For years, the studios have opened movies at Cannes to critical acclaim, such as Pixar's Inside Out. However, last year, Disney premiered both Elemental and Indiana Jones The Dial of Destiny at the festival to so-so reviews that really dampened the buzz before their release much later in the summer. So, with the big studios largely absent this year, there was an emphasis on Cannes as an industry festival. Indeed, one of my own biggest surprises about Cannes was the sense that, for all the glitz and glamour, it's a festival where everybody is hustling. Journalists compete for access to talent, critics race to file their reviews, fans try desperately to get a hold of tickets, and filmmakers, well, filmmakers are trying to sell their wares. Let's talk about the Marché de Cannes, which was maybe my biggest revelation about the festival. I didn't even know that this existed until a critic guided me to it. It's tucked away in the basement of the Grand Palace, the central hub of the festival. Once you get in, there are several floors of smaller studios, distributors, and even national film boards setting out stalls, hoping to sell their films to various international markets. They are selling everything. Library titles, restorations, films that they already have in the can, films that are on the verge of production, and yes, unfortunately, AI. But seriously though, tell me you don't want to see Killing Pablo's Hippos, or Sean William Scott as Bad Man. And look, maybe you aren't distributing Twisters, the Glenn Powell Daisy Edgar Jones vehicle coming out this summer, but we have maybe not the next best thing, but a thing. It's an incredibly charming and vibrant hustle. Cannes serves a vital function as a networking hub, allowing people who make movies outside the infrastructure of major studios to secure the funding and distribution necessary to continue to do that. Just outside the Grand Palace, there's a little community of chalets known as the International Village, in which various countries have set up shop, hoping to convince investors and filmmakers to collaborate with them. Of course, it isn't just the smaller films that are hoping to make deals here. Many of the films in competition will sign international distribution deals during the festival, with the reaction of critics and audiences serving as negotiating leverage for the creative team. It isn't uncommon to come out of a 20-minute standing ovation for a smaller film like Flow, for example, and find a press release in your inbox announcing a distribution deal has just been signed. Incidentally, Flow also rocks. Even some of the bigger stars and films coming to Cannes are doing that hustle. Francis Ford Coppola brought Megalopolis, his star-studded passion project to the festival, in the hopes of securing international and American distribution. To his credit, he managed to secure European distribution while over there because of those wacky Europeans and their love of veteran filmmakers. Je suis française. Nous respectons les réalisateurs de notre pays. Huh. I wonder what the French word for auteur is. Kevin Costner was transparently looking for investment in Horizon, his epic four-part western. Indeed, Costner went from the premiere of the first film at Cannes straight into production of the third film in Utah. The film industry is in chaos at the moment, and festivals like Cannes are vital to the continued survival of anything even marginally outside the mainstream. These are directors responsible for movies that have won the Best Picture Oscar, earned shed loads of money, and defined their eras and Cannes is vital for the survival and sustainability of the movies that they want to make. Now, I know I said I wasn't going to talk too much about the films, but it did bleed over into the movies themselves. There were a lot of exciting films from young and international filmmakers, but there were also reflective works from veterans of the 70s and 80s. Alongside Coppola and Costner, and Ron Howard, I guess? The festival's main competition strand included new films from veterans like Paul Schrader and David Cronenberg. There was an interesting, if slightly funereal, vibe to these movies, perhaps tapping into that sense of a wider industry uncertainty. The films of Coppola, Schrader, and Cronenberg were united by a theme of grief, death hanging over portraits of a marriage. In Megalopolis, for example, the protagonist is a widower recovering from the loss of his wife. In O Canada, a dying documentarian composes a video confession for the wife that he leaves behind. In The Shrouds, the lead character operates a cemetery where the grieving can get live camera feeds of their loved ones decomposing corpses. It feels notable that outside the context of the films, each of the three directors is dealing with the loss of their spouse. Eleanor Coppola passed away earlier this year. David Cronenberg lost his wife Carolyn Zeifman in 2017. Paul Schrader has moved into assisted living with his wife Mary Beth Hurt, who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. 
These movies feel oddly autobiographical. Indeed, Cronenberg's casting of Vincent Cassell as a white-haired, sneaker-wearing Toronto resident has the same vibe as Christopher Nolan's casting of, say, Leonardo DiCaprio in Inception and Robert Pattinson in Tennis. I mean, look, if I were an auteur, I would cast Vincent Cassell as me. Even Horizon feels elegiac. Costner's 12-hour tribute to How the West Was Won, a movie that he saw at the age of seven, but which was already dated by the time it came out, just one year before A Fistful of Dollars. Get three coffins ready. Of course, it's important not to be all doom and gloom about this. After all, people have been writing cinema's obituary since almost the moment it came into being. For all the gloom and morbidity hanging over the work of these industry veterans, there were plenty of young and compelling voices. There were fresh takes and perspectives on old templates. For example, the Palm Door went to Sean Baker's Anora, which is admittedly a slightly overlong update on the classic screwball comedies of the 1930s, like It Happened One Night, for example. And there was really wonderful work in the genre space. But let's take a moment to talk about the festival itself. As it was my first time, I tried to have an experiential Cannes Film Festival. I tried to do a little of everything, to sample as much as I could. Now, I didn't get to do everything. I didn't get to attend a party. I didn't get to set foot on a yacht. And I certainly didn't get to attend a party on a yacht. Damn. Next time, baby. But I tried to get a sense of what Cannes actually is. Now, obviously this goes without saying, attending Cannes is quite expensive. I was only able to afford it by saving up my salary, insert the obligatory Patreon plug here, and by selling material that I generated there to publications like Irish newspapers and radio stations. However, once you cover your flights, your accommodation, your food, and an accreditation fee, the festival itself is technically free. Also, you get more Nespresso than any human being could possibly consume. Tickets were allocated every morning at 7 a.m. local time, which meant that I was up bright and early every morning to have the most French breakfast imaginable while frantically trying to get into the bigger films. Now, the ticketing system is subject to much criticism, particularly from older journalists who predate its introduction. In the old days, critics and journalists had to queue to get into screenings. There was a very good chance that you could queue for a movie and not get a seat. The online ticketing system may be more competitive, but it's also infinitely more efficient and it saves hours of standing around in queues in the blistering sun. Plus, the festival penalizes no-shows, so there's an incentive to cancel screenings that the holder can't attend, meaning that, with enough persistence and patience, and a strong enough phone battery, an attendee will generally get to attend whatever they want. So, through this system, I went to a red carpet premiere, which involved buying a tuxedo because my cool grey suit just apparently wasn't going to cut it. By the way, when I attended the first of these premieres, which was for Furiosa, I discovered that everybody attending a red carpet actually literally walks the red carpet, which I was not expecting. And yes, these standing ovations are as long as you've heard. Shoot the first one who stops applauding. But to be honest, they feel somewhat more genuine than I expected. For example, I found myself oddly moved by Kevin Costner tearing up as the French applauded him. I was swept up in the midnight crowd chanting, Nicolas, Nicolas. Nicola, so insistently that the theater had to turn the lights back up so Nicolas Cage could wave to his adoring fans in the balcony. Apparently, once you get in the cage, you don't get out. I got to see films in all of the various theaters around the Grand Palace, named for luminaries of the art form like the Lumiere brothers, Agna Varda, Andre Bazan, Louis Bonuel, and Claude Debussy. I learned very quickly that if you were quick enough, you could pick up tickets right outside whatever theater was screening it. So, for example, if you wanted a ticket to the new Donald Trump biopic, you could just grab it by Debussy. They just let you do that. Obviously, obviously that's not, that's not cool. However, it wasn't just film screenings. I also attended a talk with George Lucas, who showed up in a flannel shirt and runners and talked very charmingly and very directly about his relationship with Star Wars. And I got to play journalist, doing an interview with the production team behind The Apprentice, the Donald Trump biopic starring Sebastian Stan and Jeremy Strong that is still looking for American distribution before the election. I also left the city centre to visit the Virtual Reality Film Festival, an example of the festival embracing modernity and experimenting with new forms of technology and immersive storytelling. Hell, I even attended some IMAX screenings in the Cineum, a theatre on the edge of Cannes that, due to the peculiarities of French traffic, is somehow 20 minutes away from the city centre, while well, the city centre is somehow 70 minutes away from it. 
Incidentally, this was the only popcorn and sugar that I had over those two weeks. In short, I tried to do as much as humanly possible. I attended 46 screenings of 43 films over the course of 12 days. Because I don't know if I'll get to do it again, and I wouldn't have the purest experience of the whole festival. Most days? My screenings tended to start at 8am and my last screenings ended around 2am. I lost my voice in the middle of the festival, something I documented when I did the Mad Max video a couple of weeks ago. And I caught a stomach bug at 4pm on the final Sunday, precisely two-thirds of the way through my second viewing of Kinds of Kindness. I got pushed to the ground twice over the course of the film festival, by critics racing to their next screening, riding my ass so hard that they did this to my sandals. And you know what? It was phenomenal. It was delightful. I think the biggest surprise was how much fun it was. Sure, you see shots of tuxedos and hear reports of exaggerated standing ovations, and you assume this must be the dullest thing ever. However, the festival has an endearing and playful sensibility that is somewhat at odds with the assumption of how it must work. To a certain extent, it's always been like that. After all, 20 years ago, the competition strand somehow included both Shrek 2 and Old Boy. And for all the stereotypes of pretentious French art house cinema, this is a festival that loves old-fashioned American auteurs. I don't think I've ever experienced anything quite as rapturous as French audiences welcoming Kevin Costner, Francis Ford Coppola, and Nicolas Fricking Cage as conquering heroes. This, as the kids say, is cinema. There's something wonderful about going to a film festival where you can pivot from a gritty, formless, black and white Danish social drama about a notorious serial killer to a neo-noir martial arts film that features a montage set to an electric guitar version of Walking in the Air. It's something to sit in a theater full of critics waiting for the New Yorkers Lanthimos film, who begin to clap in rhythm to the baseline of Sweet Dreams as the movie roars to life in front of them. I don't know if I'm ever going to go to Cannes again. It cost a lot of money. I had to save a lot of money to do it. I had to take a lot of time off work. It took me a solid couple of weeks to recover from the experience. But you know what? I'm honestly thrilled I got to do it. The festival was so much more exciting and vital and interesting than I honestly expected it to be. It's one of the highlights of my professional career in covering cinema. It makes me feel like a real-life film critic. And I got to follow in the footsteps of, honestly, one of the great heroes of the silver screen. I've been Darren Mooney, and this was The Backdrop. Thank you.